Luskin. The largest city near Icewind Dale was Luskin, the city of sails. 16,000 humans were housed in the walled city, a number that amazed the inexperienced Wolfgar. The companions arrived at the walled city at the north gate. A single iron-bound door set into the stone wall between two short, square towers, with room for a dozen guards on the parapet over the portcullis. The travelers were directed to keep to the wall. The last lane holds the cutlass. The inn called the cutlass lay on Half Moon Street, in the roughest part of town. The main floor was almost filled by the tavern area, a single open room with a bar angled across a corner opposite the door, with wine racks against the wall behind. An open stair led to the rooms above. So few visitors were allowed in Luskin that the cutlass was only one of two inns available, but most of the rooms served as a fest hall rather than as a mere sleeping chambers. Bruner's goal in Luskin was a contact named Whisper, who could be met in Rat Alley. The alleyway lay fairly close to the cutlass, but was far enough through the maze of alleys to take some time to find. It paralleled the seaside docks wedged between warehouses, and was so piled with crates that at some points, Whisper had accomplices in windows and behind a secret low door, ready to ambush Bruner and Drizzt. She had meanwhile disappeared through an almost hidden sewer drain that led to her secret chamber, an entry room that also served as her headquarters, and beyond a sleeping chamber with privacy screens and dressing table. Although Luskin was far more populous than Bryn Shander, it covered little more area, Instead of ten towns low buildings, Luskin's structures were even more tightly packed, stood two to three stories above ground, and were delved below ground as well. Five high captains, named Terrell, Barham, Kurth, Soljak, and Rethnor, formed the city government, and each was housed in a suitably large fortress-like dwelling. The true force behind all the power of the city, however, resided in a single structure, the host tower of the Arcane. The host tower was set to stand in the very heart of the city, but it took Jirden nearly an hour to guide Entrarian Calibri from the stable inside the north gate to the pines that lined the green at the tower's base. Expansion outside the city walls on the north side of the river Mirar, however, gave a slightly different meaning to heart than just the area within the walls. The host tower was set apart from the lowly bustle of the piers. What could be more appropriate as the heart of the city than the isle that stood in the mouth of the river mirror? The host tower of the arcane was obviously of magical construction, and was unique in all the realms. It appeared to be a tree of stone. A central spire served as the trunk with four lesser spires curving out like oak branches in the four cardinal directions. All stood equally high. Each spire housed the maze controlling his or her respective direction, his or her staff, an audience hall, teaching rooms, conjuring and meditation chambers, laboratories, and storerooms. Above the ground level entry room, the archmage occupied the chambers of the central spire, while the four mages in the line of succession ruled the lesser spires. Dandy Barda modeled, current overseer of the North Quadrant, including Icewind Dale, served as master of the North Spire. It was the North Spire that Agar Castle had apprenticed under Morakai the Red, before Dandy Bar tricked Castle into murdering his master. The North Spire was typical of the design of the other three spires, the audience hall of the master could only be reached after passing through a twisting corridors and secret doors full of magical traps. In an even better protected location, Morikai had created the conjuring chamber to which his own specter was summoned by his successor. Dandibar's private rooms lay in an upper level of the spire, reached by a private corridor from the center of the spire. The room of a lesser mage, Sydney occupied the space below the master's. Her small chamber held little more than a bed and a scrying mirror 
through which Sydney learned of the companion's arrival at Long Sandal. Long Saddle Long Saddle was a small village in the midst of the farming and herding area. Its valley was a quiet, well-ordered haven between the Craigs and the Evermores. Only 130 people lived within the village, though another 800 occupied dwellings in the surrounding countryside. The village mainly served the rural area, so there was a farm market that sold food, a bell caster for cows and farm homes, a stirrup maker to service saddles, and a small inn at which the workers could gather. Long Saddle held something not common among rural villages, however, a family of wizards called the Harples. Generations of Harples had spent their lives at the hill of the Ivy Mansion, each adding to the inventions of those before him. Still, only three buildings were present. Two appeared to be ordinary, low-farm buildings, but that was hardly the case. The smaller served as a stable, but of miniaturized animals kept in cages stacked to the ceiling. The second was an experimental farm, where other magically reduced animals grazed in the open central area. The third building was a carefree college of ideas and experiments, added to by each Harple in succession. This was the Ivy Mansion. A rail fence appeared to surround the Hilla compound but it was in fact an invisible wall with a fence painted on its surface. Only the third post, left of what appeared to be a gate, was real, and the actual gate was by that post. To reach the stable, the companions passed along the mansion and crossed a strange stream that climbed the hill, became momentarily invisible, then flowed downhill on another side. A bridge with a reverse gravitational field beneath provided a path to the farm buildings, via the underbridge and a return via the overbridge. The hodgepodge construction of the Ivy Mansion had resulted in innumerable strange angles in the walls and roof, dozens of spires with no two alike, and thousands of windows, from tiny slits to huge openings. Inside, the companions too revealed a dozen alchemy shops, scrying rooms, meditation chambers, and conjuring rooms. They were given sleeping rooms and later talked with the eldest Harple, Delroy, in his small chamber. The most memorable room was the fuzzy quarterstaff, an inn-like common room. The fuzzy quarterstaff was round, with round tables and a round bar surrounding the round kitchen in the middle. A stage full of wizard-directed instruments played near the rear of the room, and a cheery hearth blazed while the companions visited with the Harples and their friends. Silvery Moon Silvery Moon is the largest inland city in the northwest, and it is economically, socially, and architecturally unique. The city is home to many schools of knowledge and wizardry, and holds one of the most extensive libraries in the north, called the Vault of the Sages. The focus on knowledge has given the city a reputation of accepting all races. Willingness to try the untried has also given the city's buildings unusual appearances. The many spires rise from structures that differ as much from each other as from those commonly found in other cities. The Icewind Dale companions and their pursuers, who had arrived a few days earlier, came to the south end of the bridge crossing the River Robin. This was the Invisible Moon Bridge. At the foot of the bridge stood a guard post. The pursuers were admitted to the city and found lodging near the center, at the Inn of the Wayward Sages, one of many inns available. Trist was denied entry to the city, however, and the companions camped a few hundred yards downstream from the guard post. 
At the time of the quest for Mithril Hall, Silvery Moon lay entirely on the river's northeast bank, and the Great Vault of the Sages stood east of the marketplace, in the city section that housed almost all the temples, houses of knowledge, and governmental buildings. In the decade following the quest, Silvery Moon continued the growth that had begun a century earlier, and expanded to the southwest bank of the Robin. During that time, the Great Library was moved to new, larger quarters, and new city walls were constructed to protect the expanding area. This was not the first such expansion of Silvery Moon. Helmer's Wall, a tavern, had once been a gate in the most ancient city wall. When the wall was raised, a major thoroughfare was feasible. At the time of the quest, a wall stood along the bank of the Robin, behind the docks, with the main gate of the city at the foot of the Moon Gate. By passing the city, the companions had crossed to the river North Bank, and were heading west through the foothills when they were sensed by the Golem Bog. As the Golem tried to reach Sydney, it bypassed the guard post at the foot of the bridge, walked across the river bottom, and punched a hole through the city wall downstream from the gate. The Heralds Hold Fast From Silvery Moon, the companions followed the advice of the High Lady Alastriel and journeyed a day to the west. Along an unmarked path, they went north from the River Robin. They crossed over a bluff and entered a dell that held a squat stone tower so ancient and ivy-grown that it was discernible only to those who knew where to seek it. This was Heralds Hold Fast. It was the repository of the history and artifacts of the races of Aaron, kept by Old Knight, one of the five high heralds of the realms. Here, if anywhere, there should have been some hope of learning the location of Mithril Hall. The huge, moss-covered stone door was smooth with age and swung freely inward when touched. A cylindrical room filled the entire tower and was lighted by a soft blue glow. This was the Chamber of Man. Weapons and armor from every age lined the walls. Above them, banners and crests of forgotten kingdoms were interspersed with intricate tapestries displaying historical scenes. Overhead, carved into the rafters, were past relief of human heroes and heroines of the past. The Chamber of Man was the largest in the Holdfast, save the enormous library. The herald entered a chamber through a wooden door opposite the stone entrance and beckoned the companions to follow deeper into the holdfast. The passage was delved into the steep hill against which the tower was set. Other chambers lined the corridor, one for each of the goodly races, and even a few for the history of orcs and goblins and the giant kind. Each was designed in the same manner as that of mankind. Later. When the companions bore Brunner to the chamber of the dwarves, he lay in the midst of the circular floor surrounded by dwarven side suits of armor, axes, and warhammers, and was looked down upon from the rafters by his deities and heroes. At the far end of the corridor, Old Knight led the companions into a room with a huge round, rune-covered table. After dining, they were guided through a final door into the largest room of the Holdfast, the greatest library of the North. This treasure trove exceeded even the vault of the sages in Silvery Moon, lining the walls and piled on the many tables, large and small were countless volumes. On a small table off to the side, Old Knight had placed the only reference that seemed to hint at the location of the companion's goal, Mithril Hall. Mithril Hall. As the companions learned at the Herald's Holdfast, the hidden path to Mithril Hall began at Saddlestone, known now as the Ruins. 
the dwarven village was above ground, something rare these days and unheard of back in the time of Mithril Hall. Built till last, the structures of settled stone were like giant houses of cards, great slabs of stone cunningly laid together. The path. After camping in the village, the companions left before dawn, following the elusive trail. Although the path entered the hills of the mountains closest to settled stone, it wound its way towards Fourth Peak, dodging ravines and boulders and picking its way up the mountain sides. As the pursuers passed over a boulder-strewn mount just before entering a thick dell, and Trary saw Bruner climb out of brush into the facing slope far ahead, and Trary estimated that his party could reach the companions before they got around the side of the mountain. He did not reckon with Caddy Bree, however, for she goaded Cheerden into following Entrary, knocked out Sydney, then with Puck following close behind, started a rock slide that buried the golem, all quickly enough to see the route taken by the companions. A few miles up the trail, Brunner stood at the lip of the keeper's tail, hundreds of feet above the floor of the gorge. He moved about on the path until the peaks to the west were aligned. He chanted, Three peaks to seem as one, behind ye the morning sun. Only from that location was the top of the stair visible, for it followed a discontinuity, where one rock type met another, and the change of color camouflaged the steps. The narrow layer descended into one sweeping fall to the right. Brunner had estimated a half day's climb from Settlestone, and it was still morning when the descent to Keeper's Dale began. It seemed hours before they reached the floor of the dale, but at the base of the stairs, Brunner continued on. Five hundred to the left, then a hundred more. The hidden line of the secret door. Given the dwarf's short legs, six hundred steps would have measured about fifteen hundred feet. Passing through the monoliths, ancient even before Mithril Hall was settled, Brunner neared the hidden door, its secret command word, though faded, and the door remained concealed. Dusk fell with the door still hidden. When Aegis Fang's magic revealed the door at dawn, the companions entered Mithril Hall. The hall. The stone door closed behind them as the companions entered the hall. The chamber was the site of the final battle that Clan Battlehammer had waged against their Drugar in an attempt to retain the delve that had been the clan's home for three dwarven generations. The ever-burning torches of the passage beyond lit the hall, revealing the remains of Brunner's father and grandfather, propped back to back. Brunner bore these into a side chamber, where he donned his ancestral armor. Thus glad, the eighth king of Mithril Hall began his trek across the top level of his former home. Mithril Hall had three primary levels, the upper was designed for visitors, invited and uninvited. Those who knew about the entrance were provided guest rooms near the entry hall, could meet with the entire clan, 10,000 strong, in the halls of gathering, and were shown the most revered treasures in the Hall of Dumathoin. Reaching these locations required a guide, for the passages were a maze. Even the potion that restored Brunner's memory did not provide total recall and much time was spent backtracking. To enemies, the passages were even more dangerous. The corridors close to the west entrance were lined with alcoves and traps, and the ones leading to Garm's Gorge were dwarf hide. In the center of the level, the maze became a single passage and was also part of the defense, with ten doors on the down slope, and beyond the ten, ten more going up, and between the center doors, a passage to lower levels, which was covered by a barred trapdoor in the floor of an oval chamber at the center of the top level. There, almost a day's walk into the great city, the companions would have rested were it not for their pursuers. Hot drafts rising around traps even in the more western corridors had warned the companions that furnaces in the lower levels were in use. They resolved to stay on the upper level. In the attack at the Oval Chamber, 
and Trarian Drizzt fell through a trap and slid into a steep and twisting chute that carried them deep into the mines. They followed a long upwardly spiraling tunnel for more than two hours. As the slope increased, both light and noise grew, and they found themselves at the top of a white gorge, the undercity of Clan Battlehammer, now occupied by the Drugar clan Ubukin. The Undercity was the primary forging and machining area of Mithril Hall. The walls of the chasm were carved in ledges, like a series of gigantic steps with ramps arcing down between levels. Homes for 10,000 were delved into the walls. Left of the entrance where Drizden and Trary stood, a bridge arched over the gorge to an exit on the far side. The only other path was through the hordes of bustling Drugar. Passing stealthily over and out, the two encountered a lone Drugar, who directed them toward the Shimmer Gloom's run, via the first passage on the left. In spite of the Drugar's fear, he had craftily misdirected them. The dwarf was able to call help and speed ahead of the two using a less winding parallel passage, while sending Drizzen and Trary down a path towards the dragon. They were so far below the bridge level, that they had to scale many feet of cliff to reach the companions. Meanwhile, Brunner had led Wolfgar, Regis, and Cadibri from the oval chamber to huge natural caverns called the Halls of Gathering. There they saw Drugar, who had ascended one of the passages from the lower levels, but the companions continued unseen. Despite his hope to reach Garam's Gorge in an hour, Brunner paused at an ornate metal door. In spite of both magical and physical traps, the Hall of Dumathoin had been plundered, for the Dragon Shimmer Gloom had cached the far wall from one of its passages beyond. The Gorge. Brunner soon reached a secret door that opened a passage branching left. It led to a bridge across the gorge but was blocked by a portcullis that could only be opened using a winch located half a day's walking the other way. Beyond the portcullis, steps descended to a guard room. Backtracking through the door, Brunner led on through the original route. After a final curve, it ended on a balcony overlooking a carved passage, with steps descending twenty feet to the guard anteroom. Brunner sent Caddy Bree back to fell the bridge sentries with arrows shot through the portcullis, then led an all-out attack on the Drugar in the anteroom. Sydney and Bok attacked soon after the Drugar were routed, but Bok was forced into the gorge and Sydney was killed. When the dwarves delved too deeply, Shimmer Gloom entered the mines from the Plain of Shadows. In the lowest point of the mines, the dragon's lair lay, an immense cavern of uneven and twisting walls, pocketed with deep shadows and a ceiling too far for the brightest light to find. A passage gave across to the great undercity, for that dragon had routed most of Clan Battlehammer alone, but from the back of the lair, a secret tunnel led to the dragon's only access to the upper levels, Karam's Gorge. Shimmer Gloom's tunnel entered the gorge far below the ledge outside the anteroom. The dragon skimmed through the lower cavern level, turned at the widest point, then shot under the bridge while rising to Brunner's ledge. Caddy Bree retreated with Wolfgar to a nearby chamber to the right of the anteroom. As Driz climbed faster and Trary forced him into a ledge, Brunner rushed into the anteroom for a weapon and found a keg of oil in the curtained storeroom area. Soaking his cloak with oil, he jumped atop the dragon, poured the remainder over the scales, and set Shimmer Gloom aflame. The dragon fell to the depths of the gorge, its fire visibly from the ledge a thousand feet above. The trauma was not yet complete, for Entreri had scaled the last few feet, captured Regis, and crossed the bridge. By the time Driz reached Wolfgar and Caddy Bree, the assassin released the bridge rigging, destroying the only easy way across the gorge and forcing the companions to edge along the narrow southern ledge. Finally, they reached the eastern exit, high above the river Serberin. They departed, thinking Brunner dead, but miraculously he had survived, escaping at last up a chimney that vented on Fourth Peak.
Neverwinter Wood. Due west of Longsaddle, at the eastern edge of Neverwinter Wood, stood the Tower of Twilight, the abode of Malkor Harpel. Drizzt and Wolfgar left the immediate pursuit of Entreri, hoping the help gained from Malkor would prove worth the delay as indeed it was. The enchanted Tower of Twilight rose from an island in a small pond, but it was invisible in sunlight. As the light faded, the tower appeared. An emerald green bridge spanned the water to the island, leading to an equally green tower with sparkling twisting spires. No door was visible, and the apprentice mage who greeted the two friends appeared to pass through the stone wall. It was actually an extra-dimensional portal. Upon entering, the visitors discovered a wide circular chamber, lined with stalls for steeds along one wall. A corridor from the chamber gradually arced along the tower's inner circumference, its incline growing more steep and its circles more tight as it wound its way to the top. Malkor's study occupied the main upper level, its door opening directly from the spiraling corridor, yet the passageway continued to serve the turret chambers. At a slightly lower level was the dining room. Before the companions retired to one of the tower sleeping chambers for the night, they were led on a tour of the tower. Finally, they passed from the main corridor into the intersecting passage in the second level. Opening a heavy door, they entered a treasure trove, Malker's Museum. From a cabinet opposite the door, the wizard took the magical horseshoes that allowed Drizzt and Wolfgar to reach Waterdeep in only two days' time, and from the weapons rack, he gave Driz the elven scimitar, Twinkle. One of the great aids Malakor offered was not in his possession, however. It lay in Agatha's lair. Agatha, the Banshee of Neverwinter, had amassed a fairly large treasure hoard including a magical mask that could alter a person's features, and did so for Drizzt, all except his lavender eyes. Agatha's lair could be reached from the farming village of Coneyberry by passing only a few hundred paces down a twisting path into the dangerous wood. The lair was small, a mere dome formed of tree branches. It could be entered only by crawling through a small hole at the base. The dome was stronger than it appeared, for the branches were supported by a mesh of netting that trapped Aegis Fang when Wolfgar tried to open a larger passage. Agatha's major defense of her treasures was a maze of illusionary mirror images. The maze contained only one real mirror, creating half of the maze. A reflection of the magic mirror spell Agatha cast over the other half of the lair. As Drizzt crept along just left of the door, he could see the mirror across the chamber, reflecting Wolfgar as he entered the lair. On Wolfgar's second cast of Aegis Fang, directly across the fire, he broke the mirror. Behind the mirror's stand was another opening, the doorway to the treasure room. Drizzt had reached the magical mask.